we're missing one of our speakers. Yeah, yeah. Without Uri. We are moving right along. Uh, we're a little bit late. Uh, we're trying to catch up. I'm Richard Cooper uh, from Harvard University, and we're going to talk about the world economy in this session. Uh, Ten days ago, there was the annual meeting of the World Bank and the IMF. And on such an occasion, the IMF comes out with its World Economic Outlet. Over the past 10 years, the IMF has typically been too optimistic in assessing the near-term next two years outlook. And uh, regularly, they've had to uh, revise downward their estimates. So this uh, past 10 days was noteworthy for one of the very few times they revised upward their forecasts. And there's a general uh, sense of buoyancy about the world economy at the present time. And um, at the same time, however, the IMF comes out with a second, less publicized report uh, called uh, Global Stability. And there they said things look fine in the short run, but all of the risk, not all, most of the risks in the medium to long run are on the downside. Uh, that particular report got less attention, but they point out a number of indicators, particularly rising debt. Uh, around the world. So um, we have here a marvelous panel, well experienced. I'm not going to go through them. You have their names and bios in your book. And I'm just going to follow the order on our program. I've asked each speaker to talk just for eight minutes. Uh, and uh, I hope that leaves some time for questions. Uh, and. Uh, uh, at be, before we have to yield our time. So I'll just turn it over right away. We'll go right down the order. Start with Uri Dadush. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> so as um, uh, Richard uh, uh, intimated already, uh, the world economy is in the midst of a broad-based expansion. According to consensus forecasts, or the IMF forecast, which is actually very close to the consensus, we're seeing 3% real growth in 2017 using market exchange rates as weights. And this implies a half a percent acceleration, which is really quite notable for the world economy compared to 2016. And it also marks, for the first time since the financial crisis, a return to the 20-year trend uh, of world economic growth. Uh, so, uh, you know, I agree. I've been doing this for a long time, uh, looking at the world economy in various contexts. I agree that uh, 2017, 2018 will be good years. And I also agree that there are uh, big risks uh, when you look further out, although my focus is going to be on the real economy rather than the financial issues raised by the stability report. I'm sure others will cover financial issues. Um, so 2017, 2018, good years, why? Four elements, just very quickly, these are well known. Um, steady growth across all the large economies, accelerations of economies that have been in trouble, uh, Russia, Brazil, Japan, and Italy in less trouble, uh, in the past, but very sluggish growth. You're actually seeing decent growth in these large economies. Uh, the second element is uh, uh, policies are helpful. Uh, monetary policies remain uh, uh, very uh, stimulatory. Fiscal policy plays a large and neutral role. Uh, the, the tax package announced in the US suggests that there will be some fiscal stimulus uh, coming in the United States. So it could be even, from the short-term point of view, a good thing. Um, the third element is uh, 
you know, we've had very slow growth. We've had 10 years, terrible time, really, in the world economy. There's a lot of pent-up demand, and there's also a lot of underutilized capacity. So in half of the 60 largest economies in the world, unemployment is still over 5% at the moment. That's a good indication of underutilized capacities. And finally, inflation is very subdued. Oil and commodity prices are uh, uh, still very moderate. And um, uh, so uh, inflation is under the 2% benchmark. Uh, that's at the headline level. If you look at the underlying inflation, it's even uh, lower than that. Um, so uh, these are the elements, essentially, of the, of the optimism for the short term. If you look at imbalances, there's actually relatively few imbalances in the advanced countries. People will challenge me on that. Uh, the big exception that I see is uh, Germany's gigantic current account surplus. But it seems like the other countries, uh, 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 particularly European countries, have learned to live with that. Uh, so uh, I actually, when I look at risks, I'm not being politically correct. Uh, I actually see relatively little by way of short-term uh, downside risk in the course of the next year, year and a half. When I was running the forecast at the World Bank, I would have been more cautious. Um, I don't see much downside risk. Uh, in fact, I see some upside risk. Uh, uh, and 2018 could be closer to 3.5% uh, than 3%, essentially because, from my experience, when the world economy gathers momentum like that, there is a self-feeding mechanism. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why, I, when I go into 2019, I think people might be surprised by the, there will be some pickup in inflation and markets may be underestimating uh, the rise in interest rate that will, be, uh, that will be needed, not necessarily in 2018, but going into 2019, and that could cause some issues. But as I look at the long term, uh, then uh, I want to talk about the long term because for me it's the most important at the moment. Uh, the, um, uh, there are... Uh, uh, so, if you look at the long term, we've had a slowdown, big slowdown in the labor force across the world. We also have had relatively low investment uh, in recent years, and productivity growth has been relatively slow. So, it would be imprudent to assume uh, that you're going to get more than about 3% growth over the next 20 years as we did over uh, the last 20 years. But I want to make two qualifications on the optimistic side. One is that we don't really understand what drives productivity. Total factor productivity is measured by economists as a residual from a regression, which essentially means we don't know what, uh, what is driving it. And there could be a lot of innovations uh, coming down the pike. There's a lot of indications that there will be. So we may be seeing accelerated productivity. But the other factor, which is perhaps just as important, is that regardless of what's happening at the technology frontier, developing countries are so far behind uh, the, uh, the technology frontier, and they now account for about 40% of uh, world GDP at market exchange rate. Uh, and they're growing about two and a half times faster uh, than advanced countries. Developing countries uh, can do even better uh, than uh, uh, what they have been doing in, uh, in recent years. And that, together with the possibility of a productivity acceleration, could make us quite optimistic about the medium term. A lot depends, and in fact, it is very important what the policies that are pursued in developing countries will be with regard to whether they're going to fulfill uh, that, uh, that potential. And that is where I go now in the long term and, sh and tell you about my pessimism, why I'm very worried about uh, the, the policy picture. 
And I could mention two or three things, but I'm going to focus on one since we have very short time. And the issue I focus on is uh, protectionism. Um, I don't mean to pick on the United States. Uh, I live in the United States. I admire the United States. Uh, the United States is the most open, large economy. And protectionism today is a much more prevalent feature outside the United States than in the United States. However, the fact that the United States is turning inward is profoundly significant. Furthermore, I see US protectionism as not just a temporary Trumpian aberration, but the result of the US economy's failure to adjust to stagnant wages and rising inequality caused by technology and globalization. And Kemal, to my left here, and I wrote about this risk long before Mr. Trump uh, came on the scene, like several years before. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, current US policies, I'm finishing, current US policies such as tax cuts and reductions in health coverage are not only failing to deal with the underlying problem, but they're making it worse. Protectionism in the United States is bound to be profoundly destabilizing both at home and abroad and it's going to give a very bad example to the developing countries that we hope would be the future of our long-term prosperity. And if it persists, if we don't have some unexpected event, and of course there could be, given what's happening in the US at the moment, uh, if it persists, then we, we may soon be looking at the 3% global growth rate of 2017 with some nostalgia. Very much. I think we will come back to the question of protectionism later, but now I'd like to call on Kimmo Dervis to make his presentation. Thank you, Richard, and uh, I, I will not repeat things that have been said uh, because the uh, IMF's WEO, most of us have read it, and, and it is indeed in a long time the first time that the IMF has become more optimistic than it was in the, in the uh, past edition. I, I want to focus on, on really two points. One is this issue of debt and interest rates and, 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 and whether that is a major risk. Clearly, the amount of total debt, private and pub public jointly, and of course, I'm talking of gross debt. I mean, there, there's a netting out process, but gross debt to GDP has increased, is, is higher today, significantly higher, depending on the measurements, uh, the, the exact figure, but it's, it's about a third higher than it was at the beginning of the 2008 crisis. This debt is, is carried and is feasible and doesn't create too much of a problem because of extremely low interest rates. So if there was a chance for interest rates, if there was a probability of interest rates rising, the overall debt situation in the world would, would be a problem. However, I, I don't foresee these interest rates to rise for various reasons, both supply side and demand side reasons. Uh, 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 Uri has mentioned the, the low inflation. And so at least in the next few years, I, I don't see that that is a real risk, despite the fact that debt is so high. I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's a hypothesis. If, if, if this hypothesis about interest rates is wrong, then uh, we could enter a major crisis situation because debt really is very high. The second point I want to make, and I think that uh, is about the productivity paradox. We, we, we just heard, most of us must have heard, uh, been here for the last session about digital communication news, and you know we're entering, we've entered a world, uh, 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 artificial intelligence, a booming technology world. And if you look at these technology stories at the micro level, you would think, as a macroeconomist, that productivity growth would be rising very rapidly. But in fact, the opposite is the case. Both labor productivity and total factor productivity are 
rising slowly, much more slowly than they have in a long time. And that is pretty much a global phenomenon. It's, it's true in the US, it's true in Europe, it's true in the major emerging markets. So this is a very strange situation. On the one hand, you have this booming technology, innovation, and on the other hand, you have measured productivity uh, in terms of GDP statistics that, that is actually slowing down and, and it is slower than it has been in, in, in the last, uh, you know, for, for, a very, for, for decade. The decadal trend has been much, much faster. Now, quickly, two points, and our time is very limited. Is this a measurement problem? Some people will immediately say, this is a measurement problem. Um, there are some measurement issues, but there are important papers that have been written uh, uh, that actually show that measurement only explains a, a very small part of the problem. And of course, we have to remember one thing. Productivity GDP, measured in, by in GDP does not try to measure consumer surplus. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to get too technical. Consumer surplus is a different concept from GDP. And it may well be that consumer surplus is rising, but there's also been research on that, and even if you adjust for consumer surplus, again, you don't find that te technology is, is, is rising, uh, the total factor productivity or labor productivity is rising rapidly. So this is a paradox. This is a strange situation, which, you know, which, which, is, a, which is a real puzzle. And we're, we've done some research, which is not finished, but the story that comes out is, is, is very interesting and has to do with something that we wrote together also some years ago, income distribution. What's happening is that the firms, the best firms on the frontier, are actually increasing their productivity quite well. So th there, is, there is rapid total factor productivity growth and labor productivity growth among frontier firms, among the best firms. But they are a small minority, and they, they, their weight in the overall economy is small. The other firms, the median firm or the lower below median firms, is showing, in most cases, negative total factor productivity growth. So we, it's not that innovation is not happening and is not translating itself into the productive sphere. It is, but, at the, but only by a minority of high-performing firms. And this has, of course, one that has many implications. One can be hopeful because that the diffusion might occur and you know that, 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 that would solve the problem, although there's data that shows that diffusion is actually slowing down. But it has one very important consequence also. It is making the income distribution even more unequal. It is one more factor of why the income distribution is becoming more unequal, and I think I've run out of time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Young, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to this very excellent conference. And uh, it's a very big honor for me to be with these excellent uh, speakers and professor. And today, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, two parts uh, of my presentation. In the first part, uh, I will review uh, the current economic developments in major countries for our discussion. And in the second part, I will talk about some uh, cross-cutting uh, downside risk factors for the global economy. So uh, as you know, uh, and uh, as IMF uh, forecasted, the global economy is obviously uh, recovering uh, uh, these days. Uh, but uh, I think the world economy is yet to uh, make a complete recovery from the 2008 global economic crisis. It is still uh, suffering from a long period of weak economic activity. Uh, but uh, uh, from uh, the beginning of this year, uh, the world economy uh, started to show some different landscapes. Let's see the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy, I think, entered the cyclically very new phase uh, 
you know, the U.S. Fed uh, is expected to raise its uh, policy rate once again within uh, this year, and it has already announced the uh, balance sheet normalization uh, program. Uh, it started uh, from October this year, uh, and uh, so uh, we uh, project the U.S. economy to grow at 2.1% uh, uh, in 2018. Uh, it is a little bit uh, higher level than uh, this year's growth rate. Uh, the driving force of the U.S. economy is, I think, the strong pickup in uh, private consumption and investment and based on the improving labor market and weak dollar. Uh, thanks to the weak dollar, the U.S. Uh, export to the other countries has recovered uh, these days. And, however, I think there are two uh, main uh, downside risks for the United States. The first one is the policy uncertainty under the uh, Trump administration. For example, yesterday, uh, the Trump administration announced the new tax cut uh, program. Uh, if the tax cut program actually be implemented, then uh, that action uh, will uh, have some a big impact on the long-term interest rate and the U.S. dollar exchange rates. So uh, there are uh, still a lot of uncertainty surrounding the Trump administration's economic policy. This is the first uh, downside risk factor. And the second one is, the, as you know, the, the normalization of the monetary policy. Uh, Yesterday, uh, uh, President Trump uh, nominated uh, Jer Jerome Powell uh, for the next Fed chair, and, and maybe he will uh, still uh, maintain the monetary policy stance uh, in the coming years, but uh, there remains still a lot of uh, uncertainty surrounding the monetary policy in the U United States. And the second is the Eurozone. The Eurozone is also picking up this year. And uh, the inflation rate of uh, Eurozone has moved to around 1.5%, which is a, a very closer to the 2% target. But uh, the unemployment rate is uh, still very high. It remains at uh, 9 0.1% in recent months, a record low uh, still uh, for the last uh, eight years, though. Uh, the increase in growth in 2017 reflects an acceleration in exports uh, and a continued strength in domestic demand. Uh, but uh, there are uh, still uh, downside risks. Uh, we are very concerned by the two uh, major downside risks. The first is, you know, the uh, Brexit negotiation, and the second is the weak growth in real wage. The, the real wage growth is very, very weak in the European economies, and that is, I think, the main uh, barrier to the uh, active recovery of the United States and the European economies. For Japan, uh, we see a very similar economic recovery process, but uh, Japan, Japanese economy has the same problem, very weak growth in real wage. This is a very big problem, and I think this is, uh, uh, this is the main reason why uh, we cannot anticipate the longer-term economic recovery in Japan. And for China, uh, we expect uh, still very high level of uh, economic growth next year, 6.7%, uh, a little bit uh, lower uh, than this year's uh, ex expected growth rate, 6.8%. But I think the Chinese economy's the biggest problem is 
it is kind of uh, that fueled economy, that fueled economy. Uh, the, so uh, I think the issue should be addressed if the uh, sustainable economic growth is to be maintained for a longer term in the future. And we expect further economic recovery in some large emerging economies, especially in Russia and uh, Brazil. You know, these uh, economies have suffered from recession for the last three years due to the drastic fall in oil, gas, and other commodity uh, prices. Uh, these economies are, however, showing an upturn uh, recently, and this trend is expected to continue in the next year. Uh, but uh, the problem in these economies is that they are too dependent on oil, gas, and other commodities. So uh, they need to diversify their economy uh, much stronger. I will uh, briefly mention the cross-cutting uh, potential negative factors for the global economy. The first uh, risk factor is, uh, which is already mentioned, uh, inward-looking protectionism in the advanced economies. This is a very big problem for many countries. For example, the South Korea uh, is facing very big problem with uh, the US because the US government asks uh, the renegotiation of the, the Korea-US uh, FTA, a uh, big issue in South Korea. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we have to be careful of the proliferation of uh, the inward-looking protectionism in advanced economies. And the second uh, risk factor is, the, uh, the uh, as I mentioned, the very weak uh, real wage growth rate uh, in advanced economies, especially in the European countries and in Japan. So big uh, problem for those two big economies. And lower inflation rate is also a very big problem. Uh, a lower inflation rate tends to lead to weaker consumer confidence, weaker business confidence. Uh, so uh, the world economy has not uh, succeeded yet in completely ending the deflation mindset, which is very, very prevalent in many advanced uh, economies. And finally, uh, the, I'd like to mention the changes in international financial conditions. The U.S. Fed has already begun to raise its policy rate, and there is a mood of uh, tapering in the European Central Banks. Uh, the, there are many emerging economies propelled by capital inflow from the advanced economies. That fuel emerging economies, I think, should normalize their balance sheet before a accommodative financial conditions are ended. This is a very big uh, policy tasks for the emerging economies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Ito. Thank you. Uh, I echo many points just made by previous uh, speakers, so I try to be selective. But it is obvious just the world economy is in expansionary process. Uh, if you look at stock prices, or employment number, or growth rate, or even just rising long-term interest rate, it all shows just world economy is expanding. But probably this is not the place where you're just speaking only optimistic picture. So let me just raise three uh, maybe concerns or problems. Some have already said by other people. One is just very low growth rate. Not, not just growth rate, very low potential growth rate. So this may be very much related to what people call uh, the secular stagnation. And uh, behind uh, is the very low productivity. I don't know how technology is related. It may be too early to speaking about just in influence of AI or IoT to the productivity, because if you look at the previous innovation, uh, there's some long time lag 
between the introduction of technology and growth. But I think maybe I agree to you that there's some substantial structural problem in the economy, which just makes the growth rate is very low. So in Japan, we have a lot of discussion about just in increasing importance of a reform to just accelerate the reallocation of resources, especially reforming labor market is very important. Without just real reallocation of labor, it is very difficult to just raise the growth rate. And also, uh, in the case of Japan, and perhaps maybe many other countries, just the investment of human resources is very weak in the past. And so that may just uh, provide another reason why productivity is grows. And trade is very important. Uh, there are many uh, discussions about the increasing uh, protectionism. And yes, that is a concern. But at the same time, uh, the, still we can have some uh, perspective about just the increasing uh, the, uh, the free trade regime. Uh, in the case of Japan, for example, the, uh, the economic partnership with, United, with Europe, I hope, will be concluded by the end of this year. And also, even TPP, although the United States is out, but we still try to just uh, finish the TPP 11, I mean, excluding the United States, by the end of this year. But this kind of, I think, uh, just uh, in the stepping forward, is very important in, in order to just uh, uh, get more profit uh, by suppressing uh, the, uh, the idea allocation. The second concern, which is also talked by some other people, very low inflation rate and wage rate. And usually, low inflation rate is very good. But you, we have to remember just major countries just uh, implemented very, very expansion in monetary policy and very stimulative. Uh, economic policy and very low interest rate, but still the inflation rate and wage rate is very low, especially in the case of Japan. If you look at the Japanese case, as you know, we just introduced very expansionary monetary policy and unemployment rate uh, is the lowest in the last 20 years and stock price is the highest in the last 20 years. Still, inflation rate is just around 0.5%. And wage is increasing very slowly and so because nominal GDP is increasing, that means very dramatic drop of the wage share in GDP. So there must be some kind of structural problem here again. I don't know, technology, maybe, maybe measurement, but we have to think more serious, seriously about this low inflation rate. And third, I think Kemal just mentioned the importance of the, the risk of debt, and I, I agree. But I want to just emphasize the other side, risk of the asset. <laughs> Uh, you have to look at just the price of the stocks and real estate. Because of the maybe low, very, very low interest rate, uh, in most countries probably the stock price and the real estate price is the amount of the highest in the, in the past. And uh, it's very difficult to say whether this is bubble or not because of the low interest rate. But however, in the process of the increasing interest rate from now on, I hope, uh, it is very uh, possible that the sudden drop of the asset price uh, after the interest adjustment. And increasing interest rate is very important process for normalization of the global economy. However, increasing interest rate is very difficult process if we just expect some kind of reaction of the asset price. So we have to watch very carefully about the response to the asset price to the interest rate. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, last, uh, Mr. Zhao Yi. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the last presenter of this uh, panel. Uh, obviously, I guess I have some uh, disadvantage because so many issues have been covered by uh, previous uh, panelists. Now, I'm going to try to turn this disadvantage into advantage. So, I decided to do uh, as the following, I based on what uh, panelists say, based on uh, my understanding, I, I try to summarize uh, four issues uh, currently international community are much concerned. Uh, they raise some questions uh, on this uh, important issue uh, we are facing. First uh, issue uh, regarding the recovery of uh, world economy. Uh, it's obviously uh, everybody recognizes now uh, world economy uh, under the recovery. The, the question uh, people raise is 
this recovery can be sustainable or not. Also, so-called secure stagnation claimed by Larry Summer still exist or not. Uh, furthermore, uh, we see the, the sign uh, the monetary policy in advanced countries has already uh, started to change. Uh, people summarize uh, maybe different uh, speed in same direction. That means the QE will gradually exit. These uh, exit, QE exit, what's the impact on the global liquidity? particularly on developing countries. That's the kind of uh, question people raised on the first issue. Second issue is how to deal with the uh, possible negative part of globalization. Uh, even people support globalization, recognize uh, some possible negative uh, outcome from uh, globalization, particularly uh, Although globally, the income equality has been reduced, I mean, among the different countries, the, the equality will be reduced. But in each of country, no matter advanced or developing countries, income equality, the gap uh, wide, how to solve uh, the issue. Some people propose to take what they call UBI, Universal Base income. That means every citizen can get a minimum uh, income from uh, government. Of course, people argue whether these can be affordable to do that. So some people propose maybe take another measure, tax credit, encourage people uh, hard working, but at least give some minimum income. That's the second uh, issue. Third issue, what's the impact of new technology, uh, particularly uh, artificial uh, intelligence, uh, fintech. Uh, the, the second panelist uh, described, maybe not necessarily obviously have some positive uh, impact or benefit from uh, in terms of labor productivity or total uh, activity, uh, productivity. Furthermore, even people argue maybe AI itself will threaten the human being existence, whether it's exaggerated or not. Some people are very much concerned of these positive or negative impact of new technology. The last issue, I guess, how uh, to uh, prevent in the future against financial a crisis, uh, people mention almost 10 years past uh, since the outbreak, uh, global financial crisis. Uh, people argue, uh, what's the next time for uh, Minsky time come? Uh, so some sign uh, people worry about, uh, for example, people mention uh, is uh, still we have a very high leverage uh, level. Also, in fluctuation of cross-border capital Yes, you can see uh, immediately before and after uh, global uh, financial crisis, the fluctuation of cross-border capital is very uh, dramatically. Uh, later on, after the uh, outbreak of global uh, financial crisis, yes, the fluctuation a little bit come down. But among the developing countries, the fluctuation is still very high. So people still worry about that. The next uh, part of my presentation, I want to, because I'm Chinese, I want to talk about some uh, Chinese economy, although uh, some panel have already uh, touched upon. I guess uh, one or two years, uh, many people, uh, international uh, community, worry about uh, the possibility of a hard landing uh, for Chinese economy. But now nobody talk about that, because uh, so far, a Chinese uh, economy perform uh, relatively well. Um, last year, uh, the GDP growth uh, was 6.9%. Uh, in the first uh, third quarter this year, also GDP growth uh, reached same 
6.9%. The IMF uh, raised the, their forecast four times uh, this year. Now they forecast maybe at the end of this year, GDP growth of China can reach 6.8%. Uh, but don't forget the target uh, for Chinese government uh, uh, set at the beginning of this only 6.5%. So I don't see any problem for uh, uh, growth rate. Uh, that means the, generally uh, the Chinese economy uh, have already uh, stabilized. Even next year, I guess, uh, is the same situation. Obviously, uh, another issue people raise uh, many times uh, about debt, debt ratio in China. Even SP uh, downgrade uh, of Chinese uh, sovereign uh, uh, rating. Uh, generally speaking, the, the debt ratio in China uh, generally is, a, is a okay, particularly uh, government debt and household debt uh, relative to other countries is, is low. The issue people worry about is the debt ratio of non-financial sector. Uh, probably now they reach your 160 uh, percent of GDP, uh, which is uh, uh, very high. Uh, the issue, yes, uh, we should be take care of uh, that issue. Uh, at the same time, I don't think we should uh, exaggerate the the the. The issue, because in China um, there is some difference um, uh, with other countries. First of all, um, the the these uh, business uh, or corp that are that high, one of reason is SOE uh, state owned enterprises uh, has a very high uh, debt issue, but among them actually is the local governments use this SOE as a, flat, uh, as a platform to uh, raise, uh, to get money. That you have, we have to understand that the local government in China, they have a lot of resource, they have assets, so they can cover uh, this debt. That's the first uh, reason. Second reason is that some people calculate in terms of size of financing for these corporations, almost same with the United States, with the uh, EU, because China, uh, we use more uh, indirect financing rather than direct financing. So they, it's hard for uh, Chinese corporation to get funding uh, from stock market rather than uh, just borrow money from bank. So um, the, the example, uh, it's a very interesting example, I guess last week, I guess uh, one week ago, uh, Chinese governments in many years uh, issued the US dollar uh, uh, sovereign bank uh, in Hong Kong uh, for two, uh, uh, two uh, billion US dollars. Actually, at the, the end, the, the year is very low only a little bit higher than U.S. Treasury, I guess, by 0.125. That means the market still treats sovereign debt of China uh, is high. So I guess uh, that's the general uh, description on Chinese current uh, situation. Of course, tomorrow we have another workshop. I I'm going to talk about long term, what's the outcome of uh, 19th uh, uh, National Congress of Communist Party uh, from uh, economic uh, interpretation. That's tomorrow. Uh, I stop here. Thank you very much. Um, so you've heard uh, wide-ranging presentations. Uh, the world economy is a big topic. We haven't covered all of them uh, issues, but you have an excellent panel here who's capable of covering almost all issues. And so let me open it for questions. We have about 25 minutes, I'm told, and I uh, need some lights out there so I can see hands someplace. Okay, so let's start here. Please say who you are briefly, and if you have a question to direct to a particular person, do so, or to the panel as a whole. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mayor Shitrit from Israel. I would like to raise the question of debt, which uh, Mr. Dervis spoke about it. The fact that the situation today of the interest is so low, sometimes even negative, 
pushes the people to invest their money or even to take loans in order to buy stock market because it's going up. What, do, what is your expectation on the future of the stock markets? Because I'm afraid that if it falls, it's not only falling of the stocks, but it will be fall of the big debt and create a big crisis, even, even bigger than 2008. I would like to, uh, to know what you think about it. Okay, let, let me collect several questions and then uh, we'll turn to the panel. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much. I've got two quick questions. Uh, first to uh, Kamal Dervish. His comments reminded me, I think, back to the solo paradox of the late 1980s when it was argued that there are computers everywhere, but it's not being reflected in, in productivity. And I'm wondering if, the, if there's an analogy to be drawn there, and also you, Professor Cooper, because I remember reading and using a lot of the work you did on, on stagnant wages, which also started during that same period. So I'm just wondering if there's not you know, an analogy to be drawn uh, <coughs> from what we experienced then to what we're experiencing now. <coughs> I don't know, so I'm just asking a question. The, the second one is the question of these uh, trade deficits and protectionism in the United States. Um, President Trump and his team, uh, including Ross and Lighthouser, seem to focus almost exclusively on currency manipulation and so on. Now, is this fair? I mean, uh, you know, you've got a $356 billion deficit, I think it is, with, with China. And these numbers, I think there are about four major ones that jump out, Germany, China, Japan, I think Mexico, but South Korea thereafter and Canada, who are actually lower. But I'm wondering, is this, is this correct? Should they not be focusing more on American consumption habits, on investment? Um, because it seems exclusively at that level to be focused on currency manipulation and on fair trade practices. Let's collect a couple more, yes, there. I'm Salim Damej, a researcher from the Central Bank of Morocco. Uh, if um, I would, to, would like to thank you for the quality of the, your presentations, I have a remark from the uh, fiscal monitor of the IMF, which is inequality. We learned from this uh, last edition that if uh, inequality uh, declined uh, between countries, it was widening within countries, and here, do you, I want to ask you, do you share their recommendation to enhance uh, uh, the tax progressivity? And uh, also, if you can recommend uh, this proposition uh, of uh, enhancing investment in education and, well, and uh, health, because it's uh, an ex-ante uh, treatment, and there is also taxation, which is an ex-post treatment. Thank you. Any further? Yes. Right, yes, right here. Uh, thank you very much, Tatsu Master from NECB Business School in Japan. I have a question to probably uh, former Minister Kemal Dervis. Hearing all these great stories and together with the uh, current fashionable talk about industry for fourth industrial revolution, I fear social divide or economic divide. Companies, individuals who can ride on all these quick changes can take advantage of those. But companies and individuals who are left behind could have no chance of taking fruits of this. The result could be social or economic divide within community, within the country, within the region. How do you foresee the risks of this divide expanding or shrinking? Thank you. Okay, let me turn to the panel uh, and ask for solicit responses, and then I'll go back to the audience. Uh, Camo, a few were addressed to you. Why don't we start with you? Well, I totally, totally agree, and in fact, that was one of the key points, I think, of my quick presentation, that inequality is, is, is a major, major issue. And the past trends which have made intra-societies very unequal, although between countries, because of the growth of developing countries, global inequality may not have increased, has, has maybe even decreased. But inequality inside the countries are in, is increasing everywhere. And one of the reasons that I tried to, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons is that those who are doing well 
are doing better. And those who are, who are not doing so well are doing less well even than before. So today it matters a lot in which firm you work. It, 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 education also matters, of course, and your health systems and so on. But there is a concentration of power and wealth and productivity growth in a small number of firms, many of them global firms, where, whereas a lot of other firms are being left behind in the dust. And uh, uh, this will, will create social problems uh, I, I think of, of a major magnitude which we are seeing happening all over the world. So I think that, that the inequalities side of the equation in, in looking at the world economy has to be underlined very strongly. Now the, the, the question on asset prices, be, because of the low wage growth, low inflation, I don't see any major push towards any rapid kind of normalization of monetary policy. So, I mean, I, I think asset prices may perhaps have overshot, but I, I don't see a major, you know, collapse of asset prices in, 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 in the global economy. I think income distribution and the social consequences of income distribution is a much more serious problem than the asset price problem. And I do congratulate the IMF for having taken on this problem, you know, in the in the old days it was just a, a, a footnote maybe in in an IMF report. But today the, the IMF is actually addressing this issue as a major overall macroeconomic issue, microeconomic issue, uh, which gives me some hope that uh, that policies will be addressed. One final thing, I think it it is in line with President Macron's uh, policy also. You, you have to attack the problem before ta transfers and taxes. Transfers and taxes can correct things, but if the primary distribution is very unequal, it's very difficult to make it more equal with transfers and taxes. So the real, the real issues are competition, entry, small enterprise, access to credit, education, health coverage, and things of that sort. Taxes and transfers are important, but if you don't solve these problems, you, 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 will, not be, you will not be successful in, in, in reducing inequality. Thank you. Others want to comment? Uri? Uh, yeah. Yes, so um, just some follow up. Obviously, Kamal and I agree on these, on these issues, the, uh, particularly on the inequality question. Uh, just a couple of uh, kind of elaborations. One is uh, the wage stagnation is uh, very important uh, when coupled with inequality, but there's a big difference between advanced and developing countries. The developing countries that are growing fast are seeing wages rise even as inequality gets worse. So at least people feel, yeah, even the people who are, who are losing out, so to speak, in relative terms, are gaining in absolute terms. And that's very, very important for social cohesion. The problem in the United States, uh, particularly in the United States, but it's also true in other countries, is that you have a combination of wage stagnation and wage declines for some parts of the population, like white males, uh, uh, at the same time as you have rising inequality. So that's very important. The second is, on education, uh, yes, of course, I believe in the importance of education. Um, education as a cure for inequality, we have to be very careful because it depends where the money for the education goes, all right? In the United States, there's a superb educational system, but in many respects, it's also been a disequalizing educational system with, with huge differences in quality between the very top and uh, and uh, you know what, what is available at the base, which has to do with the way a lot of high school and elementary education is financed at the local level in the, in the United States. So education, yes, uh, but it has, to be, uh, uh, it has to be targeted. 
Uh, one point also quickly on asset prices, Mr. Shetrit's point. Um, uh, historically, you know, a big adjustment in the stock market by itself has not actually induced, you know, typically has not resulted. We've had many examples of very large adjustments in the stock price, uh, which have had relatively uh, minimal uh, uh, effects on the real economy. Um, and, and I agree with Kemal that the uh, adjustment to date has been gradual. If you see inflation pick up uh, in the course of about a year from now or so, then I think we should, uh, we should be, be worrying more. Final point is insofar as a lot of the stock market purchasing is by private institutions, uh, people who can take risk, even individuals, yeah? Who, take, who can take risks. Uh, there's only so much that they'll allow you to borrow margin, for example, I can tell you from, private ex from personal experience. Uh, then I think the, the effect is less. It's when you have very highly leveraged institutions like the banks that are taking all sorts of risks, which could include the stock market, but, but typically doesn't, uh, that you can get a, a major financial uh, uh, cataclysm. Professor Ito. I have a comment about the relation between technological uh, development and the economic growth. Uh, someone just mentioned Solos paradox, where we can't see any of the result of the technological advantage to the macroeconomic growth. But uh, if you uh, just read, for example, the study by Robert Gordon, he just showed there's some kind of increase of the productivity, say, between, say, 1990 to 2000. So there was some kind of effect on productivity, maybe technological development is not strong enough to just have a continued uh, technological development. And another very important area, as I already mentioned, there's a very serious, a big time lag between the timing of technological introduction and the result on the economic activity, because industrial structure have to respond to absorb the result of technological progress. Now, just remember, major technological development we often discuss today, like a deep learning of AI, or just expansion of Internet of Things just happened in the last maybe five years. So we have to be very patient to just wait for just result of the technology to be just reflected in the macroeconomy. And also I just want to make a very brief comment on the, uh, the bilateral trade deficit surplus with the United States and exchange rate. Uh, I have to just want, want to comment, this is not the first time Japan just, you know, suffered a lot of this discussion in the 1980s and 1990s. So when the trade issue is become very serious, the United States is awful, or always just uh, you know, mention trade uh, deficit and exchange rate. And of course, this is very dangerous. But at the same time, we have to be very patient to negotiate and uh, discuss the issue. So I think the trade issue is very important. But uh, uh, this is, uh, I'm not just very pessimistic at this moment. Okay. I might uh, comment on the last point. Um, um, I'll make a strong statement, which may not be true. It <laughs> needs to be tested. I do not think our new president, Donald Trump, is a protectionist. For reasons that I find obscure, uh, he has a particular animus against countries that have big surpluses with the US, China, Germany, Canada has even been added to the list, Mexico, and so forth. Uh, but I don't think he's intrinsically protectionist. There are two ways to eliminate a bilateral surplus, which is the wrong policy to focus on, but it seems to be in his mind. The other one is to restrict imports, and the other is to raise exports. And I think he'd be happy with either, probably, maybe, preferably, raise exports. He has pointed, appointed some people who are protectionist, and, uh, but I consider that a major question mark in the Trump administration, whether he's protectionist or not. He's talked around it, and he's so far taken no actions, apart from abandoning TPP. And uh, even in the renegotiation of NAFTA, the guidelines which were published 
uh, remember this is a 25-year-old agreement, uh, were perfectly reasonable in terms of bringing it up to date. They were drawn, ironically, from much of the TPP negotiation. Now, I've been around long enough to know that with trade negotiations, you, they're not done until they're done. <laughs> and so we, but, but we have to wait to see what's going to come out of these uh, negotiations. But uh, just to uh, comment on that, it's certainly a source of uncertainty, and the tone is very different from previous American administrations. So that's concerning. But um, I, I would not write him off yet as a protectionist and is leading the world down the road of protection. Let, let me ask you the question uh, regarding the low interest rate, uh, which I remind me and uh, think that uh, uh, one very important, very interesting speech made by Stanley Fish uh, in July. Uh, the speech is specifically targeting the low interest rate. He described the negative of uh, low interest rate, also identified the reason behind the low interest rate. I recall he mentioned a couple of things. First of all is the aging population. Population become older, older, which will create the demand very soft. That's the first. Second is technology advance also create some income equality. Uh, I can uh, record one figure. When Facebook got IPO, the market value equivalent to GM, but uh, Facebook only hired 7,000 employees, while GM hired 250,000 workers. You can see the asset concentrated on small people. That's also created some low uh, demand. Here, I want to add one factor. Um, not many people mention, because I recall before the, the, the global uh, financial crisis, one term be uh, used frequently, so-called great moderation. That means that time, growth rate very, very fine, is good in advanced country, also low uh, inflation rate. The one of reason behind that is at the end of the 70th of last century, China started to take open door policy. 10 years, India take that. Also that time, Soviet Union collapsed. Almost two billion people get more or less get into global integration, which created uh, a great demand for advanced countries. Now these dividends have been dramatically reduced or disappear. I guess that's the very important factors. Then I answered the question regarding the, uh, the, the, the trade uh, deficit. I guess the trade uh, deficit of US, the reason is uh, very complicated. But one factor we don't forget, US had a trade deficit with 100 countries, not only with China, with German. Yes, China and German occupy large share, but the US have a trade deficit with 100, more than 100 countries. So yes, I don't deny there's some room for US negotiate some deal with some country, can, which can be reduce the deficit. But another factor is we understand Saving and investment, the difference between saving and, and the investment equal the difference between export and the, and the import. That means the saving rate in US relative to investment is very low. That means the investment need in, U, in US in some way creates trade deficit. That's something I guess we should uh, look at uh, a little bit comprehensively, not only focus trade deficit. That's my uh, thinking. Okay. I'd like, uh, I sorry, Mr. Young. Yeah. yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, I'd like to add uh, the one more uh, comment about the trade deficit with uh, uh, South Korea. Uh, so uh, the key word uh, is the aging population. So we conducted a uh, empirical study uh, about the uh, reasons why 
many e economies enjoy uh, the trade surpluses. And we uh, uh, examine the relationship between the surplus and the population aging. So the, the, the two variables have very strong and positive relations. So, uh, you know, the Korean, uh, Korean society is experiencing very, very rapid aging problems these days. And so I think in 10 or 20 years, maybe Korean economy will suffer from kind of a trade deficit because of uh, the aging issues. Okay, thank you. I'd like to make one further comment about the trade issue. It's another identity. Um, uh, Zhao drew our attention to the identity between a trade surplus or deficit and excess savings over investment. Another identity is that for every trade deficit, I'm using trade in a comprehensive way, including services, there's a, a capital account surplus. And you think about that for a minute. Uh, if we want to uh, reduce the US trade deficit significantly, which Trump says he does, uh, it means also reducing the US capital account surplus by an equivalent amount apart from measurement errors. And that means less foreign investment in the United States. The US has an enormous amount of foreign investment in the US net. Uh, some of it goes into US corporate bonds and US government bonds. A lot of it goes into equities, including the very companies we've been talking about, Facebook, Google, and so forth. And one way of putting it, which economists have not absorbed yet, in my judgment, is that the US has a comparative advantage in producing new firms. And the new firms are, if they succeed, of course many of them don't, but if they succeed, they're attractive around the world, not just in the United States. And as long as this process continues, there's going to be a net capital inflow into the United States, and with a floating exchange rate, ergo, trade deficit. Now, I don't know if any of Trump's advisors have pointed out to him that eliminating the trade deficit means eliminating uh, the net capital inflow into the United States. Uh, we have enough time for one question. I'm, I see from the clock up there. Anyone? Way back there. For, for Yuri and, and uh, Kamal. I'm a little puzzled by your... Uh, identify yourself, oh, please, Jeff. Yes, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Frieden from Harvard. Um, for Yuri and Kamal, I'm a little puzzled by uh, your view on uh, the debt issue. It seems to me that the question is not whether nominal interest rates are low. It's what the relationship is between the growth in debt and asset prices. Um, the fact that interest rates are lower in, in our, is irrelevant to the asset liability mix. The fact that interest rates are low, in fact, means that the central banks may have lost a lot of the bullets in their arsenal. So can you say a little bit more about why you think this is not a problem? And then a second question for Kamal. I'm a little confused about your, your notion that we should focus as a policy variable on pre-tax, pre-tax transfer income distribution. That's a 40-year process. Reversing it is probably a 20-year process. It seems to me that if the problem is income distribution, saying that what we should focus on is pre-tax, pre-transfer is a formula for not being able to do anything in the short and medium run. I'm not sure I actually understood this oh. question. Well, I'll sure. give it to Tank. I, I do believe it is very important to focus on the pre-tax and transfer distribution issues and what creates it. For example, monopolies are an issue here, pre-tax, pre-transfer. If you put all the burden of correcting the maldistribution of income or the very unequal income distribution on taxes and transfers, you run tremendous political problems and also inefficiencies in the, in the whole system of ta taxes and transfers. So I, I do believe that real wage growth, competition, 
productivity growth that is much wider, more widely shared. These are things that uh, will create a healthier income distribution. I'm not saying one shouldn't work on taxes and transfers, but I don't think that one should put the whole burden of, of, of it on taxes and transfers. And, and I think this is uh, uh, really a very cru crucial point because you know, in Europe, for example, you already have 50, 55% of GDP uh, worth of expenditures by, by the government. I mean, how can you reach 70% without creating major inefficiencies? On the other hand, if you democratize the production process and allow small firms to do well, allow easier entry, uh, put barrier to monopoly profits and, and, and monopolies, you can, do, you can do all these things with, with much more an, an efficiency characteristic to it than via just taxes and transfers. The, the, the other question, I'm, I don't know, I'm, Uri, do you want to answer these? I'm not sure I understood it, honestly. Uh, can you repeat the question, Jeff? No, no, no. Oh, sorry, I'm, sorry. I, I, I'm going okay. to, I'm going to close. We're going to have a discussion over dinner uh, <laughs> in which Jeff can clarify his question. Uh, I'm going to bring, bring this session to a close. And uh, it just remains me, I hope, on behalf of all of you to thank our panelists very much for a very interesting Thanks. conversation.